that one too. All right. So eight eighteen on a Monday morning, and uh, fellas may have heard uh, a rumor, may have heard something about uh, Griner Motor Company and uh, closing the Douglas store. Uh, mm-hmm. That happened uh, late. Uh, Friday afternoon, the word okay. came out anyway, uh-huh. and uh, thought I would invite uh, invite our friend in, president of uh, Griner Motor Company, uh, Phil Schmidt, who joins us in studio this morning to talk a little bit about that. Phil, good morning to you. Good morning, Brian. So, no rumor; it is fact. Uh, you are closing the uh, the Douglas uh, Griner Motor Company store. Yeah, we are. We're uh, closing it effective the thirtieth of April. Let's talk a little bit about background on this, and uh, because I know this is not just something that you pulled the trigger on uh, on Friday. This is something you've been talking about for uh, for some time. Is this tied to the uh, downturn in the oil field and the coal uh, the coal business as well? Well, we're definitely uh, dealing with a new economy out there, and it is a situation when you have uh, the layoffs like we've seen in the industry. Uh, it certainly can take an impact on a community the size of Douglas. Yeah. So so why does one not uh, sell a dealership as opposed to just closing a dealership? There's a lot of things that go into a dealership, Brian, and uh, one of the things is the manufacturer's desire to have uh, a dealership in a community the size of Douglas. And I think what we've seen is over the years, uh, it, and I've seen it all during my career, which is about 28 years now, where the manufacturers said, you know, we have a lot of costs associated with supporting a dealership. Those costs are going to be the same cost regardless of their dealing with a store in Casper, Wyoming, Douglas, Wyoming, Rollins, Wyoming, uh, any community. So the manufacturers have been taking a real hard look at their distribution system. So uh, they have a lot uh, in the uh, decision process as far as saying, are we really excited about having dealerships in small communities? Which to me is kind of a shame. As you know, I enjoy history. And uh, around the, uh, I think it was in the 30s, there was like 300,000 car dealerships. I mean, you had Hupmobiles and Studebakers and Packards and everybody could work on them. And now today you're probably talking about nationally, uh, 13, 14,000 uh, dealerships all across the country. But at the same time, uh, you know, when there when there were that many dealerships out there, it was a, it was a time when there were handwritten receipts. There were uh, guys with wrenches that could climb into an engine compartment and work on uh, work on a vehicle pretty easily. Uh, technology has brought us a long way, both good and bad. Uh, I mean, you've got uh, you've got computer systems that you have to have. You've got uh, technology in the uh, shop that you have to have. And when you're talking about a couple of different dealerships, or rather, a couple of different manufacturers here now, you're doubling down on costs uh, there as well, aren't you? It definitely is a two-edged sword when you're talking about technology. <clears throat> I've had some friends that I've invited to take my uh, demos, and they're just really kind of excited about the uh, seats that I have that will massage you as you're going down the road. <laughs> uh, so unquestionably, it's a situation of technology is both good and bad. And I'll, I'll tell you, between the Dodge lines that we carry down there, there are 23 different uh, just types of vehicles. I mean, you've got your Cherokee, you've got your uh, Ram 1500, you've got a Chrysler 200, you've got all this. On the, on the Ford side, we've got 18 different uh, uh, vehicles that we're carrying. Now, when you get into that, you then have the combinations. Do you want a long box? Do you want a short box? What do you want? So between all the choices that you have to offer the consumer and then the manufacturer saying, along with those uh, choices, you have to have spe- uh, specific training. You have to have specific tooling. Uh, you don't get a choice from the manufacturer. And by the way, this isn't necessarily wrong. Uh, they will tell you they will pay warranty if you have training for your employees. That's That, that makes sense. Uh, but that uh, training with these technologically advanced vehicles is quite expensive. Uh, each year when they come out with a new vehicle, we're all excited about seeing that new vehicle. Uh, and then the reality comes in for a car dealer because the manufacturer then sends you a bunch of special tools and an invoice saying that regardless of, uh, again, the volume you may have or the size of a community, you're going to have the same tooling costs in one community as a much larger community. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about what the impact on the community is. Uh, first and foremost, I guess, on, on employees. Do you have room then here in Casper to bring them up to uh, the GMC store or to uh, Griner Motor Company on uh, CY? You know, we're very fortunate in that we're going to be able to make uh, uh, jobs available for some of the people who will be displaced from there. Uh, We've got some great people down there. Uh, We've got uh, an HR person and a parts and service director that's been going to uh, different uh, uh, 
tech schools all across uh, the Midwest. They've recruited some terrific technicians. This will be a really good opportunity for them to blossom. What does this do for the community itself, though? Because I know that you have been involved with the Boys and Girls Club down there. You've been involved with uh, the state fairgrounds. You've done a number of things in the community. Uh, do you still do you still make that return to the community? Certainly, this is a, a very personal thing for me because I've got uh, or had uh, family down in Douglas. Uh, they had been down there for many many years. So when the opportunity came to to buy the dealership, it was kind of a coming home thing for me. So, yes, we have donated a lot to the community. As a matter of fact, I'm very proud that uh, $250,000 was uh, put into the Wyoming State Fairgrounds. Uh, there's a gal by the name of Denise Lyons that runs the uh, Community Foundation for the hospital down there that we're able to work with her and get a van uh, lined up for the oncology program. Uh, the Boys Club, as you mentioned, and uh, we still have some things planned between now and uh, when we officially lock the doors. Uh, to support uh, one of the different entities down there. And again, it's a, uh, Douglas is kind of a personal thing for me, and it's something that we will continue to support. Does this, uh, does this affect what you do here in the Casper, uh, in the Casper area now as far as, uh, as far as car sales go? The reality of it was that we were probably selling more Ford cars and trucks from our uh, CY location into Douglas than Douglas itself was selling. No kidding. And it's one of those things where, uh, again, going back to the number of product lines, which between the two is over 51 different lines, excuse me, my math would be 41 vehicles. Um, you get on the internet and you see that uh, uh, one dealership has got six F-150s. And then you say, well, we're gonna go up and uh, eat at the Red Lobster at the Fire Rock or something like that. And uh, you say, let's just take a peek and see what uh, the dealers in Casper have. And on F-150s, if we've got six down in uh, Douglas, we've got 60 uh, here in Casper available for sale. So it's one of those things where I think truly we can look at uh, technology, not only in cars, but technology and how we shop as one of the big factors here. And again, uh, sad to uh, a sad report, but again, uh, it sounds like uh, the Douglas dealership closing effective uh, April 30th, uh, uh, here just a couple of short weeks away. Uh, what about that inventory then? Uh, are, are you selling that inventory in Douglas? Uh, are you bringing that to Casper? What do you do with that? Brian, what we want to do is we want to go out with a bang, not a whimper. <clears throat> and that's one of the things we thought long and hard about because uh, sometimes it's a situation where somebody will just come in, put a key in the lock, lock the doors and call it good. Uh, we want to sell those vehicles. We do have arrangements with the manufacturer, but the manufacturer said, sell them. <laughs> and my name's on the sales and service agreement, and they're kind of looking to me to do great things. Mm. <laughs> so as a result of that added pressure, we certainly want to sell them. And uh, we're wanting to do that not only on the new side with the, uh, the products that we have on the Dodge, Jeep, Ram, and Chrysler side, uh, but we're wanting to do it in the Ford side. We're wanting to do it on the used side, too. I mean, let's be honest. It's going to cost us money to transport the vehicles and everything else. I would rather we sell them out there. We go out with a bang. We give some great deals. And uh, we, we end up on a very positive note. Yeah. Well, a company that has been doing business here since 1970, uh, we wanted to get ahead of the rumors and the, uh, the different uh, stories that were out there uh, and make sure that everyone knew the story from uh, Phil Schmidt this morning. Of course, as always, if you have any questions, I'm guessing uh, we can call you at the office. Yeah? That's where I live. Phone number 266-1680. You can stop in and see uh, Griner Motor Company, 3333 CY Avenue, 6301 East 2nd Street, and again through uh, April 30th uh, there in Douglas. Uh, Phil, thanks so much for the time this morning and the information. Great. Thank you, Brian. You bet. Uh, again, Phil Schmidt with Griner Motor Company. Again, if you have any questions for them, uh, don't hesitate. 266-1680.